G'day, g'day How you going? What do you know? He'll strike a light G'day, g'day And how you going? Just say g'day, g'day, g'day And you'll be right Turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 4 as we continue our journey through the Bible, Acts chapter 4. And we'll be looking at verses 32 through chapter 5, verse 11, because it's all within the same context. As you know, the chapter and verses uh, were not inspired by uh, the Lord. Uh, it was put there by man to help us out. But this is one of those chapter division breaks that probably should have been kept in, in one section. Uh, and it begins to deal with the, really the tremendous fellowship that the early church had uh, amongst themselves. And so the final verse of this chapter is really going to give us a glimpse of the inner workings of the early church. And, um, and how they enjoyed this really closeness uh, and unity that caused the world to sit up and take notice. Uh, something that is so desperately needed today. And... Uh, for those that are taking notes, the title of this message is The Sin of Hypocrisy and Its Consequences. And let's pray. Father, as we open up your word that we would see your heart behind it all. This is an interesting story. We don't fully grasp it all, but we see you are a holy God. You're also a loving God and a generous God and a gracious God. And so we are so thankful that we have the word in our hands to learn to grow into a deeper intimate love relationship with you so as we study this your word this time that you would speak to each and every one of us in jesus name amen just to bring some of you up to speed and just to recap a little bit of where we're at again chapter four started out with peter and john uh, they were arrested they were placed in the jail uh, in custody because the Sanhedrin, who don't believe in the supernatural, they don't believe in the resurrection, are grieved by the preaching of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God blessed their testimony and some 5,000 people came to the Lord uh, and came to believe. After that night of being arrested, the next day they were tr before trial. They were before the officials of the Sanhedrin. Uh, with Ananias and Caiaphas and amongst others that were present there. And Peter, filled with the Spirit, as we see, preached the word to them. He proclaims Christ uh, crucified. Uh, he rose again from the dead. And it shows them that Jesus' resurrection was always foreseen back in the Old Testament. That he was the stone which was rejected by you builders. And uh, which has become the chief cornerstone. And he also underlines the fact of the salvation is only in Christ. There's only one way into heaven and that is through Jesus Christ. As verse 12 says, there is no salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. So all the other ways out there which people claim or all these other books out there, they're wrong. There's only one way to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ. And then last week we saw in verse uh, 13... Uh, through 18, we saw how the Sanhedrin were concerned about the boldness of Peter and John, and they gave them severe threats. It wasn't just a threat, but severely threatened them, um, not to say anything uh, in this case that uh, so it w wouldn't spread like wildfire. That was their danger. They're, they're scared for that, so they threatened them. And, and essentially, the apostles answered, well, we can't do that. You know, it, we ought to obey God rather than man we need to do those things that please the Lord and uh, so after further threatening them they release them and uh, no one can really deny the miracle of the previously uh, lame uh, beggar that was 40 years old that gave positive proof for the miraculous work there so after this incident we see how Peter and John immediately go to the assembled Christians that were there their company and they're praising the Lord wholeheartedly for his power and work of creation that he is sovereign he is almighty God and uh, and the person work of the Lord Jesus Christ as we saw in verse uh, 24 through 30 and, and they ask God to bless them and to use them uh, in, in demonstration of the truth of their message to others through the signs and wonders. So miraculous things that were happening. And we see in verse 31 that the Holy Spirit shakes the place that they're in. Uh, and he fills them. And their prayer that is that they would speak the word of God with boldness. They had the courage 
You know, and God, give us the words that we need to say to reach these people. And, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life should always lead to the boldness in speaking God's word without compromise. What an amazing move of God uh, that was starting out in this early church. Now we continue in the chapter, starting in verse 32. It says, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say the things say any of the things that he possessed was their own but they had all things in common and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the lord jesus and great grace was upon them all i love that last sentence their great grace was upon them they're experiencing just a move of god there and as we see with this church here in jerusalem there was a dynamic church uh, they were experiencing a, a great spiritual blessing uh, and power this was the ideal church, the, um, and, and no local church uh, since that time has experienced a move like this. Now, again, God has blessed uh, churches and moves over time, um, over the last 2,000 two years or so, but the early church, how it started out was very unique. Uh, just, just even the story that we're about to read, uh, we've never read anything like this any time since then. So there's a special work that was taking place here. And a lot of what we see here in the early church is what revival would look like. Anyways, in a, a paragraph very similar to this, in Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47, Luke emphasizes the unity of the church, but here he, he adds a note to its generosity. And um, if you wondered what these early Christians were like, well, we see very clearly. Not only they were filled with the Spirit, but we see unity there, and uh, where it says that they're of one heart and soul. Uh, so perhaps it's maybe the way they prayed. Maybe it's because of what God was doing in their midst. And so they had all things in common. The word common there, it's a word kornos, very similar to koinonia, fellowship, uh, but kornos means partakers, partners. So they were of one heart, one soul, um, they weren't talking about it just uh, theoretically uh, possibilities of sharing life um, of Christ, but they were actually experiencing the life of Christ. So it's one thing to, to talk about it, but you've got to live it out. Um, and, and so they didn't just give intellectual assent to unity and oneness of spirit, but they experienced it. They lived it out. And uh, the sharing of the life of Christ and the body of Christ gave them new attitudes and perspectives uh, so that everything um, that they possessed that belonged to the Lord, it's God's anyway. You know, you come to that place where, you know, you surrender. You know, he's the one that provided for you. He's the one that gave you life. And after all, you've got eternity. You've got uh, the forgiveness of sins. But what we've seen happen so many times these days in so many churches, they've lost that spirit of cornonia, that fellowship, that commonality. It's possible to come to church and you sit in the chairs or the pews or whatever, um, is, is provided there. Uh, there can be a, a united uh, in presence with other Christians, singing the same songs, hearing the same message, um, and, and relate to God individually, but they don't have a sense of body life. It's just individual stuff. They come, they go. They come, they go. Um, and uh, there's no sense of really belonging to one another. And that's kind of where we're starting to see there's a, a, a move that I believe is taking place around the world in many churches. They want that belonging. They, they want that fellowship. They want that community. And not just it's just about them. It is possible, again, to come church to week, you know, week after week, year after year, and never really know the people whom you're worshiping the Lord with or fellowshipping with. Uh, so, so where's the heart? Where's the unity? The, the early church knew they belonged to God, and they also knew that they belonged to one another. And this is what was uh, lacking in so many places and churches today. And as we see in the early church, they were functioning with uh, one organism, uh, the body of Christ. And as a result, they were responding and taking care of uh, each other's needs. And as we see in the church today, there, there are people filled with the Spirit, as this church was. When that does take place, people respond to the needs within the body. God puts it on your heart, you respond, you help out in, in various ways, shapes, and forms. No one among the believers in this church in Jerusalem was forced to give anything. It wasn't you're forced to do anything like that. Uh, it was the Spirit of the Lord within each person which motivated to give uh, in the way which they gave to one another. So this is where 
it was just something that was out of the generosity that God put in each other's hearts. It wasn't something that they're demanding, okay, everyone, you sell your houses and you bring all the proceeds to the, you know, the, the common treasury. But this was just a tremendous testimony of what the Lord was doing in their midst. Uh, the Apostle John uh, wrote that a test whether or not uh, we are true Christians is whether we are, are not truly or, or we do have God's agape love uh, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That is one of the fruits of the Spirit. As Jesus says, all people will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. It also says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is uh, from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So that is going to be one of the manifestations. If you have a right relationship with the Lord, you're going to have that love for our brothers and sisters and for others. Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17 likewise prayed for all believers that they would be one as well. And so we see that's what was happening in the beginning of the church here. The Lord was blessing the church in Jerusalem. They were living in such a powerful and beautiful fellowship. And, and Luke writes the blessing here where they were uh, a, a great grace or abundant grace was upon them all. Isn't that cool to see just the outward result of the work of the Spirit there? Verse 34 continues, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all the possessors of the land or the house uh, sold them, uh, or possessors uh, or brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed uh, to each one as anyone had need. So not only were they spirit-filled, but they're united, but also they were unselfish. This passage shows a very um, distinct Christian view of possessions, that it's not centered on ownership, but stewardship. And that's a better way for us to understand. It's about stewardship. God's entrusted you with this uh, property, with this job or whatever. Uh, we're not told that these Christians uh, sold everything. That's not what it's it told us there. In some cases, it might have happened, uh, but more likely they sold a portion of their possessions. And they some total of it they they put it into the common treasury to meet some of the needs of the saints there in jerusalem because no doubt as people came to the lord people once they knew that they were christians they were probably fired from their job you know things were kicked out they were evicted so what what would have happened in a situation like that where again this is where we take care of one another the money that was brought to the apostles uh, they had now the responsibility uh, over how the money would be distributed. One, one Christian didn't give um, uh, another Christian directly. I mean, sometimes it can happen, but a lot of times they do it indirectly or anonymous. You know, just God's put on my heart to give to this person, but I don't want them to know that I gave it to them. You know, so it doesn't become a weird situation. So sometimes you do it through an anonymous way. And that happens all the time through the church. Uh, people know of a need. They, they tell us about it but they want to give to that need. And so, um, you know, we'll just say that the, you know, the Lord's put on someone's heart to give and we keep it anonymous. And so sometimes that happens with whether it's financial need or uh, groceries or whatever else, you know, you name uh, whatever the need would be. But there's this common fund and only the apostles had the wisdom uh, as, as to how the money would be distributed. This was not, and this is where people would, get a false idea of what this was about this is not christian communism okay this was not communism or anything like this the giving that was done here was strictly voluntary uh without compulsion by man uh that's where communism it's like you're forced on it you have to do it but this is a choice uh, no one was forced to sell anything uh, they grew in their faith to the point that their possessions uh, had little meaning to them. And they just felt, you know, I'm going I'm to help these people out, you know, in whatever way I can. Uh, the distribution also wasn't done equally for uh, some Christians probably received more aid than others. Uh, a, a married couple is not going to have the same need as a family of five or eight. Okay, so the needs are going to be a little different. So you're going to meet those needs a little differently. So it's not, okay, everyone gets the same thing. You know, so as the need arose and there's a genuine need that they, they had. But the Bible does teach, again, there's this property that we do have, but, um, you know, we're to be stewards of it. You know, how he's blessed us with it. And, and we've we got to be wise with the stewardship, wise with the, the finances that he's blessed us with. Uh, and it's really for the furtherance of the gospel. And God expects his people to give liberally uh, as he has blessed them or prospered them in the right sense of the word prosper. 
um, that they would give out of obedience to his commands. And as he blesses you, you bless others. You become this conduit. Years ago, I was attending a missions conference, and um, there was this topic of giving that was brought up. Some of you probably heard this before when I've mentioned it in times past. There's five types of people, five types of givers. Uh, you have the infant, non-giving. They just don't even give. Then you have the next age group up, which would be kind of like the kindergarten or prep. Uh, this is kind of impulsive. This is where most Christians are. It's emotional giving. It's impulsively. And you can see that with some of the kids and how they're impulsive with their actions. And then the elementary. This is kind of going through middle school, if you will. When Christians move from sporadic, impulsive giving to giving as a way of life. And this is typically where they would become those uh, tithers, that 10%. Um, and this is kind of the starting point where the New Testament would come in place. Uh, the New Testament doesn't necessarily specifically talk about tithing. That was really the starting point. They gave more than the 10%. That's a New Testament way of giving. 10% uh, was typically what was done in the Old Testament. Um, and then you have the manager. Uh, this is kind of your investing. Uh, you're, you're ready and willing to give, and you become that cha channel of blessing, not a reservoir, you know. Um, and, and then as you have that ability to manage and to invest and to, you know, God blesses you with even more. You become that good steward. Uh, but if we hold on to things, how is he going to bless us with more and to give out? You know, you become that, that conduit, if you will. And then there's the sacrificial giving. Everything's the Lord and it's faith giving. And uh, you're just trusting in the Lord. Um, so those are some of the, it was just interesting and very convicting when I first heard that. Um, but uh, those are some of the different components when it comes to giving. But in the New Testament, there's no rec other record besides what we've seen here of communal sharing. Uh, and, and so we shouldn't really apply this passage universally to other groups of believers. This was something that was done at this point, and this was the starting point of the church. doesn't mean this is something that everyone has to do or every church has to do, um, but this is something that was unique here. God deemed it necessary at this time and this place and laid down a general principle of, of um, you know, sharing with others. And as a result, there was no needy person that was among them. So they were unselfish, they were united, they were unafraid, and uh, they, they, looking back at the prayer, that we see the fulfillment of uh, the, the powerful witness. Um, and, and their clear focus on that witness was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, so we need to make sure we, we have really our identities in Christ. We, we know who we are in Christ. We obey, we're obedient to what he tells us to do. Um, and uh, as Christians, we must walk in his grace, walk in his agape love. And, uh, and as we're truly walking in that agape love, we're going to respond to those needs around us. And this is one of the things that you notice around the world when there, there's a disaster or some other great need that happens, who rises up to meet those needs? It's the Christian church. You don't see this with any of the cults out there or any other religious group. It's the Christian church that rises up and does disaster relief. Now, of course, the government does what it's supposed to do. But you see how many churches are on board with sending in teams to help with the relief or um, those sort of things, hospitals, orphanages, you name it. Uh, it's the Christian church that rises up to meet those needs. So here we see they shared uh, together, not out of compulsion, but out of compassion. Uh, not out of obligation, but out of love. And so what a great lesson for us to learn. Verse 36, and Hosea, uh, who is also named Barnabas, uh, the apostle, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, uh, having land, sold it, brought it, the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Luke here gives an example uh, to demonstrate the generosity and unity amongst the believers. And here is this individual, Barnabas. Uh, Joseph is another uh, part of that translation. He's introduced here because he gave uh, money for the sale uh, from his land that he owned uh, and gave it to the apostles to give to those in need. So Barnabas here would uh, prove to be a, a very respected and also an important leader in the life of the early church, as we're going to read more about him as the chapters continue. He was a Levite by birth, which means that he was a member of the Jewish tribe to carry out the priestly duties. Uh, but he was a resident in Cyprus. And this may explain why he was a landowner, because a Levite was forbidden to own land in Israel. 
but you can own it outside the country. And again, that was backed up by uh, Numbers 18 and Deuteronomy chapter 10 and also Deuteronomy chapter 18 talks about that, that Levites cannot own the land. Barnabas, as you know, would travel with the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey. And uh, the, uh, John Mark, who is the author of the, the Gospel of Mark, was his cousin. Barnabas, as we mentioned before, he becomes a prominent figure in Acts. He introduces Paul, who wanted to kill and destroy Christianity from the start. He introduces Paul to the church in Jerusalem. So he's that guy that was that in-between to really, hey, this guy's real. He's not here to kill you. He's here because he's truly converted. And, um, and reassures them of his conversion. It was genuine. In chapter 11, we're going to see that he undertook the mission uh, to minister to the people in Antioch. And uh, he was Paul's personal companion during those early uh, years of his ministry. He accompanied him to uh, Jerusalem with the contributions that were sent uh, from Antioch to help the poor there. Uh, he served alongside him as kind of co-pastors in Antioch. He accompanied him on his first mission journey. He also, at the end of that journey, he and uh, Paul... It represented the Antioch church at the crucial Jerusalem council where there's this major conflict that was happening in Acts chapter 15. Um, so which is an interesting um, you know, turning point of the church. And sadly, his close association with Paul ended um, with a dispute overtaking John Mark uh, on the second missionary. So sharp was this conflict that they parted ways. And uh, this is how, how to deal with conflict. And that you could, you know, be serving the Lord and you can have this sharp contention with some other person, a bro, another believer, another pastor, whatever. And it's so sharp, you've got to part ways with each other, and as we see in this uh, particular situation. Um, because this is the first time that we're introduced uh, or see Barnabas appearing in the book of Acts, this is why Luke kind of gives a little bit more background of him. Uh, he was a Levite uh, of the priestly tribe. Uh, he was, wasn't a native to the land. He was uh, from Cyprus. Uh, so, so Luke is not concerned how he obtained uh, the property or where it was located. Uh, it was important that it was on his heart, loving heart, um, who sold the land, brought the money to uh, lay at the apostles' feet. So he gave out of pure love, not to call attention to himself, uh, but simply just to uh, bless uh, others and it's that blessedness of giving and he represents uh, many others who also give sacrificially as an example for us to follow now starting in chapter 5 through chapter 8 it tells us of some of these internal problems that was taking place uh, inside was kind of dishonesty which we're going to read about in just a moment there's also some administrative headaches that we'll see in chapter 6 and how they need to reorganize uh, what was happening there and outside the church was being pressured uh, by persecution. But chapter 5 here continues with the story at the end of this uh, chapter 4. And we see this contrast there. Uh, and here we see the sin of hypocrisy and the consequences. <coughs> so the story of Ananias and Sapphira is one of the most that a lot of people don't know what to do with. It's one of those stories that uh, kind of feels out of place, if you will. Um, you know, because it messes with our view of God sometimes. You know, just like Jesus when he um, making the, the whip and chasing out people out of the temple. And uh, what's he doing here? Striking people dead. Uh, it's the kind of story that, you know, we'd be surprised if it happened in the Old Testament, but it happened in the New Testament. Uh, it's not something that we expect, but something that God did, and there's a reason behind it. So verse 1 of chapter 5 continues, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. So notice the, the first word there, but, which is the contrast, uh, the incident that preceded it. Uh, so Barnabas, although he didn't want, you know, want it, but undoubtedly probably received praise from the congregation there. Uh, they were probably putting him up on a platform. He didn't want it, but it's just like, look at what he did. And uh, they probably said, hey, this Barney guy is a terrific Christian. You know, he really sacrificed everything. And this praise on Barnabas probably uh, affected Ananias. And he wanted to get some of that attention. He was jealous of it. And by the way, Ananias means uh, to whom the Lord has been gracious. Uh, so the Lord was gracious to Ananias. But Ananias wanted praise 
uh, of men, not more than the praise of God. His wife, by the way, Sapphira means beautiful. And so Paul, he went home that night excited about what was happening in church and people getting saved. And then he talked to Paul about how, you know, the church giving and gave praise to this man named Barney or Barnabas. And he says, hey, look, beautiful. I think we ought to do something like what Barnabas did. So they sold a possession, received substantial price for it. And I think at this point they may have promised to give it all uh, to uh, the common treasury, as Barnabas and others may have done. And, and as they look at this pile of money, they look at the bank statement, if you will, and they say, well, that's a little too much money to give. After all, you know, what about our future? What about our needs? What about our retirement? Let's, let's hold back maybe 20, 30% or whatever and, uh, you know, give the rest to the Lord and, and, and the common treasury. After all, who will ever know? No one will ever know this. And so perhaps they're caught up in this excitement of giving. And probably, though we're not told specifically, they promise to maybe give a certain amount to the common treasury, to the, to the Lord. And, and their zeal of giving was blunted with a test that came from Satan. They were unwilling to carry through with their own commitment to the Lord. And that's where the enemy tempts us and tries us. Are we going to follow through with it? And oftentimes in the kingdom of God... Satan will counterfeit the good things with something that may look similar in many uh, respects, but at the heart of it, it's rotten. And how often do we see that with so many Christians? They want to do something for the Lord, but then they back out. Um, you know, uh, or, or think of how many Christians, they promise to live a life of purity and, and separation, and then they only back out to live a carnal, you know, compromising life. Uh, you see it all the time. You know, we have the right intentions, but do we follow through with those things? And it's going to be difficult. But this is why we need one another to hold each other accountable. Um, think of the multitudes of Christians that profess, you know, and they sing, I surrender all. Or, you know, wherever, you know, you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. They'll sing that in church or say it in church, but then they go out and do their own thing. And, um, you know, and we, we all do it at one point, you know. So, so no one here is perfect, um, but this is something that we all want to be more consistent on. This is something that we're all working on. Verse 2 continues, And he kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife, also being aware of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So they, they kept back. So the verb there, it means to put aside for oneself. And so this is also very similar to the story, if you remember, in Joshua chapter 7 with Achan. Uh, the chapter before, they came into a town, they destroyed them. Achan took some of the uh, proceeds and some of the um, you know, items. They hid it. <coughs> and um, the Lord spoke to Joshua, and they're sent in the camp. And eventually, he was found out. So this not only affected Achan, but it also affected his family as well. So this couple, they wanted the acclaim without sacrifice. They wanted comfort without commitment. And uh, they caused the first demonstration of really defeat within the ranks, um, you know, since the betrayal of Judas and also the denial of Peter. So outward acts seem so appropriate. And you also notice the, the wording there. They put it at the apostles' feet. So what appeared to be a public uh, generosity uh, was actually right here a family conspiracy but God was looking he knows the heart he knows the motivation Ananias had a right to give what he pleased to this common fund he was under no obligation uh, to give anything if he didn't want to but instead he gave everything to the Lord as he promised but then he held back a portion uh, for himself so he and Ananias had broken their pledge to God and that was what was taking place here. He was robbing God of what he originally had promised. And notice carefully, the sin, it, it wasn't a sin committed on the spur of the moment. Okay? Uh, because they talked it over before this happened. She knew about it before they took place. Ananias came to lay the money before the apostles' feet, and he stood back to receive the applause of men. And the members of the church there at Jerusalem uh, thought that the amount of money was a great sacrifice for Ananias and Sapphira. After all, they were church members who loved the Lord. 
outwardly the appearance of being spiritual, but inwardly they were fake. Their sin was not a failure to contribute. The sin was pretending they had given it all when they had not. It was hypocrisy. Uh, Hypocrisy is not just making a mistake, uh, but really it's a deliberate plan to deceive, to pretend, to cheat. Uh, Hypocrisy is the state of pretending to have that belief or having the opinions, values, feelings, qualities, standards that one does not actually have. But you come across like you do have it. Hypocrisy involves the deception of others and thus a lie. It was about a lie. And so, as we see with Ananias and Sapphira, they created this impression that they had given all, but really, they, it was only a part of it. So God hates the hypocrisy in every form of the life of the individual Christian and the life of the local church, corporately. Ananias and Sapphira were Christians, but they were phonies, and only God knew of their hypocrisy, and he did something about it. He's the one that's going to judge. He's the one that knows uh, the ins and outs of everything that goes on, on our thought process, our motivation. So from the very beginning, there, there have been hypocrites in the church. Uh, and, and no doubt today, you know, it's filled with churches. The, and, and again, we've heard the quote, you know, the church is full of hypocrites, why should I join? Well, there's always room for one more. We're all hypocrites in transition, okay? We all say one thing and do another. It d- depends on the level of what we're doing, okay? Let's just be honest here, okay? We all have our moments. We all have our areas uh, that we're struggling. I'm not who I, 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 who I am that I want to be, but I'm on the journey there, and thankfully I'm not what I used to be. We're all progressing. That's the key is keep moving forward. There's hope and help for all of us. So, so God is the one that judges And disciplines all professing Christians uh, hypocritical actions because he knows the motivations of of the human heart. So the local church, again, it's not going to be perfect. It will never be perfect because it's filled with humans, right? So we're we're never going to look for a perfect church to join. Um, And and here's the thing, probably a great burden for any leader, pastor, carries, that, that grieves is probably the sin and the struggles that people carry. Some of the the baggage that people have you know this is one of the things that you you, you know what goes on and just you, you feel for the people your heart breaks for them and, and perhaps even paul the apostle the, the sins of the saints were a greater burden the, than the opposition and the persecution that he faced it was his care for the people that was really um uh, affecting him and, and burdening in him so ananias and his wife were playing church um, and, and God wasn't going to stand for it. And, and we don't know if Sapphira challenged Ananias on this. Hey, we shouldn't be doing this. Ananias, don't do that. We, we don't know if that conversation took place, but that should take place uh, within any uh, marriage relationship. There's no license to sin. <coughs> so the lessons we learn in the, the church in this story is that we in the church need to strive not to allow that compromise, not to allow deceit or hypocrisy in our lives. We need to, you know, live our lives as pure unto the Lord as, as, as we can. Our motive uh, for what we do is, is just as important as our actions. You know, the motivation that only God sees and knows. And, um, and so, you know, in the church we, we all realize we have all sinned in the same way. Uh, in one way or another, as Ananias and Sapphira. So, so we can't ever say, oh, I would never do what they did. You know, well, you're lying. You know, you, you, you say one thing and do another, just it depends on the degree of it. So in the church, we need to realize that if the Lord's working in a way in which was on the day with Ananias and Sapphira, there'd be no church left. There's not enough mortuaries to carry all the dead people in, you know, in, in, the, in the church. You know, if God did what he did in this early church. So there's nothing escaping God's eye. And eventually, uh, every thought, every deed will be brought into account with the Lord. So this is where we just surrender to the Lord. You know, we want to live that life that's uh, above reproach. We want to live that life that's blameless. Amen. Verse 3 continues, but Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. So Peter spotted a, a fake a mile away. 
And this, I believe, was a specific word that God gave Peter at that moment. And this is the thing that I believe, as a spirit-filled Christian, God will give you whatever you need at that moment, whether it's a word of knowledge, word of discernment, or, or whatever situation you may be facing. Um, and uh, so he gave him this discernment, this sensitivity, uh, what was happening here. The Holy Spirit let him know what was going on, and he confronted Ananias about it. And it's been said that sin has many tools but a lie has a handle which fits them all. So with Ananias, no matter what area of sin, as in his case, a lie will always be found at the root of it. Whether it's pride or whether it's whatever it may be, there's, there's a lie there. A lie from Satan. Or we try to justify why we do what we do. That's a lie. Verse 4 continues, While it remained, it's not your own. And uh, after it was sold, was it not in your own... <clears throat> control why have you conceived this thing in your heart you have not lied to men but to god then ananias hearing these words fell down and breathed his last and so great fear came upon those who heard these things and the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him so no doubt ananias was in surprise and shock of this satan had moved him to act and uh, what he was doing uh, was an insult to the church. And a lie to the Holy Spirit uh, was a work that was happening in that fellowship there. He was lying to God. Um, and, and as Peter clearly states here. So that shows the deity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is God. God the Father is God. Uh, one God and three separate persons. And so, again, Ananias was free to uh, keep part of the money. Or to, to, to do that. Um, but it, was, it wasn't the sin of selfishness, it was the sin of hypocrisy. It was a lie that he did. And Peter asked him, why have you conceived these things in your heart? So when you conceive things in your heart, it eventually gives birth to sin, as it says in James. The sin is squarely on Ananias. And uh, some people like to, to play off their sin by, oh, the devil made me do it. Right? They like to blame everyone else but take responsibility, and that too is a lie. So nowhere in all the scripture do we see Satan to blame for a Christian sin. Uh, The sin comes of our own wickedness. uh, And Satan may entice us, but uh, the sin is ours. We're the ones that give in to it. We don't have to. You can say no to temptation. You don't have to to sin. And and you notice in verse 5 there, again, Peter didn't kill Ananias. God did. And uh, we're stunned to read the results of Ananias' lie, that God zapped him. Right there. We're not told exactly how his death happened. Uh, it just, he just died. Whether he had a heart attack or a brain aneurysm. Or, um, but, but the grammar here implies a divine activity without saying so. Um, is kind of the idea behind this. Something that God supernaturally did. So regardless, we see a definite cause and effect relationship uh, between man's deception and sudden death. And some people today would say, well, this is harsh. How can a loving God do something like that? You know, and, and I like what one commentator had to say about it. He says, the great wonder is that God delays his righteous judgment in virtually all cases. Ananias received exactly what he deserved. He simply could not live in the atmosphere of purity which marked the church at that time. So the sin of Ananias could have corrupted the entire church if it had not gone unpunished. So it could have affected it and we wouldn't be where we're at today if, if it didn't happen. So God didn't let it happen. And the church that, uh, again, is God's instrument to getting the gospel out into the world and it's still today. Um, so he wasn't going to let this get destroyed with the scandal from the outset. And so God accomplished his goals through and, and, and great fear and, and reverence came upon the entire congregation. So that definitely sends shockwaves to people. Oh, man, I better not do that. I better just, you know, do what I'm supposed to do and be obedient to what God tells me to do. And when you do that and you do it because you, you love the Lord and you want to do those things, that please, it's not a burden. You don't think, well, I have to do this. No, you don't. It, you get to do it, you know. So you need to change that perspective and that attitude um, that when you live that life that pleases the Lord, it's not a burden uh, to do those things, to, to follow the commands, to, to, to do what he tells you to do. Um, 
But it's a scary thing to think that God would take our, our life if, if we sin like that, right? Uh, as we see here. He can and sometimes he will. Uh, death can be that last resort. Um, and, and sometimes he brings us home rather than let us to keep on sinning in some cases. Um, the, the, the first act of deception had already played out. And so with swift justice coming to an end, we now see uh, that we'll move on and see the second act of deception. Notice in verse 7. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Don't know where she was at for those period of uh, three hours, maybe doing some errands or some housework or something else, whatever. Verse uh, 8 continues, and Peter answered her and says, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, For so much. And then Peter said to her, How is it you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out. And immediately uh, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So these three hours passed, she comes in, maybe looking for her husband, and uh, she had no idea what had happened. Satan likes to keep people in the dark. Uh, they have no idea what's going on until destruction happens. But Peter, again, he asks her, and I'm sure at this point, Peter wants her to come clean. Here's your opportunity to confess. Here's your opportunity to be clean before the Lord. Uh, and uh, he doesn't want another one of his church members to drop dead right in front of him. You know, it can't be good for publicity. You know, imagine on CNN, the, the news article, local pastor kills church member, you know, or uh, CNN or Fox News, Judy and Post. God did it, says killer pastor. <laughs> Or BBC, you know, Pharisees say, you know, we told you you were dangerous, you know. But sadly, she doesn't come clean here. She goes along with the story. It's the script. And, and this is sad because it speaks of the, the Christian marriage here. We're, we're supposed to encourage one another and help each other out in our walk with the Lord and uh, in our marriage. Uh, and, and we keep each other from sin. You know, this is, this, should, this is something that shouldn't have happened. Uh, they, they should have stopped it there, but it didn't. So she told a bold-faced lie to, to Peter. And, uh, and, 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 and one that didn't take a whole lot of discernment here uh, to see what happened to her husband. You know, obviously he got zapped. She's going to get zapped. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira had considered together to sin against the Lord, uh, uh, to lie in order to gain recognition. That was part of the, the motivation behind it. They wanted the applause of people. And so, um, and, and, and adding uh, to what uh, her sin was and trying to cover up her sin for her husband. You know, she's trying to cover up for him. Deception always generates more deception. Uh, be, because we want to cover it up. That, that's always the case. Uh, th that's the whole point of deception. Hypocrisy and deception, which are all lies, have its consequences. And, uh, and like we talked about last week, sin cannot be hidden from God. Just like Adam and Eve. They tried to hide and, and uh, they got kicked out of the garden uh, and brought death to the entire world through their sin. Uh, so this was a sad day for the church there in Jerusalem. Sapphira realizes she's been caught in her lies and uh, then Peter drops the, the bomb on her that her husband's also dead. So justice falls on Sapphira just as quickly as it did with her husband. So the young men that were, you know, just got done burying Ananias, they're now coming in, you know, and, and imagine you can hear the, the steps coming in, and, you know, they're, they just got back from burying your husband. Now you're going to go, go next to him. So this definitely shocked the, the church members there. It, it put the fear of God in them. Now, let me give you three reasons why sin is serious. If a person who, who is a professing Christian, because I believe that Anna and I were, were professing Christians, they were part of the church. Sin is serious because of your influence. As Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So every day we have an opportunity to influence people. Your life is touching others. Uh, which way are your words and your actions pointing them in? Uh, is it toward heaven or is it toward hell? How, how are we influencing and helping others? 
Sin is serious because it will destroy your relationship with the Lord. Uh, in, in 1 John chapter 3, it says, He who practices sin is of the devil. Now, understand, that's not a person who slips and falls and immediately asks for forgiveness. This is a habitual practice. This is deliberate. This is decisions. Uh, and they stick with it. No confession, no repentance. It's a lifestyle. Uh, or, or there's no sorrow for what they've done. Okay? Sin is serious because you reap what you sow. As Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever man sows, he'll also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will reap everlasting life. So it's a choice that we have. But just as you're sowing to the Spirit, you're going to reap those benefits. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the consequences. <coughs> so there's consequences for our sins, even though, it, even if we confess and re-repent depends on what, what has done you, you need to make restitution to certain things just because you ask for forgiveness because you killed someone you're still going to probably end up in prison and doing your time um, so sometimes there's greater consequences for our sin than others notice the last verse there in verse 11 so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things no kidding <laughs> That would put fear upon anyone. Imagine going to church, you know, and someone caught in a lie and then watch that person being struck dead on the spot. The word would spread quickly, you know, and, uh, but, but God made his point. That he expects honest and integrity amongst Christians. And, and yes, you can be saved and you are saved by grace, but your trust in the grace will cause you to act like a Christian as well. It's not a license to sin. And so many people, oh, there's grace and there's, you know, God's love and he's forgiving. I'll just confess my sins later on. Um, but if we're really understanding the grace of God, you're going to want to live that holy life that pleases him. The, the story of Ananias and Sapphira is something that all of us should take note of and learn something from it. And I'm sure that the Lord's spoken to each and one of you in different ways. Um, but, but we also see just the seriousness of sin in the church. You know, and, and we see the lack of impact today because there's so much compromise uh, within the churches today. You know, from the leadership to, to the people, you name it. We all have compromised way too much uh, in di different forms. And so there's a lack of power. There's a lack of uh, revival that's happening uh, in, the, in the world today because of it. This is also, I think, the first time that the, um, the word church is used here, ecclesia. Um, and it refers to a group of people, not a building. So it's a, it's a people that we, we, we are, the church. And uh, one of the benefits of seeing God's discipline, uh, believers, is, is that people take notice. You know, uh, people, they, they, they wake up and, and they look at their own lives. You know, first of all, they, they put, sometimes judge the other person. Oh, I would never do that. They shouldn't have done this. Uh, but then, you know, we're all capable of all those sins uh, that others do. And no doubt there's much of that was going on at this point. God wants us to be pure. He wants his church to be pure. He wants us to be ready for his return. And he's willing to take dramatic steps to achieve that end as we see in our study today. Let's pray. Father, as we go from here, that we would be transformed more into your image. That you would speak to us. That we would live that life that pleases you. A life of holiness, a life that is blameless. I pray that uh, we would have the boldness to speak the truth, to tell the truth, and not to try to cover up the truth, no matter how big or how little uh, that situation may be. I pray that we would just be sensitive to your voice and that we would be obedient to you. I thank you for your precious people here, that you would radically and outrageously bless them, that you would minister to them, that they would continue to grow into a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
so